The crew of the spaceship is in cryogenic sleep. Astronaut George Taylor is dictating his final report. Exactly half a year ago by the ship's time they left Cape Canada. Over seven centuries have passed on Earth during this period. The people who send them on this journey have long since died. But Taylor has no regrets about what they've done. Everything seems different from here. The flow of time is distorted and space is limitless. The only thing he would like to know is whether humanity, the miracle of the universe that sent him into the sky, continues to wage war. A last glance at the clock. It's March 27th, 2673 on Earth. He looks at his comrades and lies down in his place. After a while, the ship makes an emergency landing on an unknown planet and finds itself in the middle of a body of water. The crew wakes up and realizes that they have slept much longer than the calculated time. But the most horrifying shock is the death of the only woman, Stuart. At that moment, water begins to enter the ship. They need to evacuate, especially since the samples showed that the atmosphere is suitable for breathing. Looking at the ship's clock, which is frozen at Earth time, November 25, 3978, the crew abandons the sinking ship. Boarding a life raft, the humans sail to shore, marveling at the grandeur of the surrounding nature. There is no sign of intelligent life anywhere. Taylor reminds them that they are 320 light years from Earth on an unknown planet in the constellation Orion. It is impossible to determine more precisely as no one has had time to look at the instrument readings. Upon landing on the shore, Taylor takes inventory of what they were able to salvage from the ship. A pistol, 20 rounds of ammunition, a first aid kit, and a three-day supply of food and water. The only question now is how long is a day here? They are discussing the strange death of Stewart, apparently caused by depressurization. It seems they were flying for 18 months, while on Earth it has been about 2,000 years. There is no hope of returning, and time has erased everything they knew. Therefore, they need to start studying this planet. Analysis showed that nothing can grow here, as there is very little carbon dioxide. But there is nothing dangerous to human health either. They have 72 hours left until they run out of food. Landon sets up a small flag of the United States of America on the shore and the astronauts set off on their journey. The surroundings are strange and wild, bizarre rocks and lifeless canyons. The people almost get trapped under landslides several times. Thunderbolts light up the sky without bringing rain. And the sky itself is covered with clouds with no satellites or landmarks. One thing they know for sure, there's a time gap between them and Earth. Their loved ones died 20 centuries ago. Even if they returned, no one would remember them. Taylor urges his comrades on. Why did they embark on this flight? Was it for fame, new knowledge, or the opportunity to live longer? But now they have lived much longer than any other human on Earth. Only Taylor set out on this journey because he's a dreamer. He is confident that there must be something better than humans in the universe. At that moment, Dodge calls out to them. He has found life. A barely noticeable green shoot has sprouted from rocky desert. This means there are plants here and they need to find them. The group continues forward. Everywhere they look they see unfriendly rocks, but ahead they see green bushes and some strange crosses that resemble scarecrows. After walking a little further, the astronauts are thrilled to finally see water ahead. The excited group quickly sheds their clothes and jumps in. After that, they swim towards the shore and notice human footprints on the sand. Suddenly, they see dark figures stealing their clothes. The men chase after the thieves, who leave behind obvious traces of their path, such as broken clothing and scraps. Soon, they come across their torn clothes and put on whatever remains. Finally, they reach a plane and see many people behaving quite strangely. They are silent and pay no attention to the astronauts, instead calmly gathering and eating different fruits. The Earthlings are puzzled as their fellow humans seem almost feral. Luckily, they are not cannibals. Suddenly, an ominous sound comes from the forest and the people start running. The astronauts try to understand what is happening and suddenly see armed riders. Shots are fired and then monkeys appear on the clearing, apparently hunting the humans. The Earthlings attempt to flee and in the heat of the chase, they split up. Shots are heard from all directions and Dodge is killed. Taylor, along with others, runs towards the river, and just when it seems like he's about to make it, one of the monkeys shoots him in the neck, rendering him unconscious. The tied-up astronaut is thrown into a cell with other prisoners. He is surprised to see the monkeys taking pictures as if it's a souvenir. George is brought to a hospital where he is examined by scientist monkeys. 
They examine Taylor who is wearing strange clothing, but two chimpanzees argue about the need to study the animal's brains, ignoring Taylor who is still recovering from his throat wound and unable to speak. In the morning Dr. Zyra does her rounds. She is intrigued by a strange animal she calls Bright Eyes because he pretends to talk in a hilariously convincing way. Taylor tries to demonstrate that he's intelligent and attempts to snatch the pencil from Zyra's hand. At that moment Dr. Zyus enters. Zyra shows him the exceptional human, but Zyus is skeptical and sees him merely imitating. Zyra tries to draw attention to the human's uniqueness by highlighting his unconventional use of a blanket as clothing and his unusual hand movements. Perhaps he's intelligent, but Zyus is irritated, dismissing it all as cheap tricks. Humans are dangerous and must be destroyed. Later they bring a female human as a gift and lock her in Taylor's cell. The next day George and his companion are walking in the yard in a large cage. Zyra brings your fiancé, an archaeologist named Cornelius, to show him Taylor, but Cornelius sees nothing special about him. While the apes argue, George writes in the sand, but nobody pays attention to him. At that moment Dr. Zyus arrives, annoyed at Zyra with her human again. Suddenly a wild man attacks George and a fight breaks out. The guards drag Taylor away and Zyus sees the letters George wrote but quickly erases them. Zyra apologizes to Taylor but he snatches the paper and pencil and writes his name on the piece of paper. Zyra is astonished and takes him home. Cornelius doesn't believe his stories, it's all just tricks, humans can't write. They try to figure out where he learned it and Taylor writes the name of his school. The apes are shocked, could he really be intelligent? The man explains that they came from another planet. Cornelius is puzzled, but flying is impossible. Then Taylor crafts a paper airplane. Afterwards he asks to see the maps and explains where they landed and how they got there. Zyra and Cornelius argue fervently. She claims that humans are a mutation, the missing link between apes and monkeys. And it is quite possible that monkeys evolved from humans. Dr. Zayas, who enters the scene, discovers the paper airplane, crushes it, and orders the man to be taken to a cell. Taylor and Nova sleep in their cell when the arriving apes order Taylor to be prepared for a castration operation. But the man breaks free and runs out of the cell. He manages to hide in the ape temple but is noticed and the man has to run through the ape city again. Taylor ends up in a museum where stuffed humans are exhibited. Shocked, he runs out into the street but gets caught in a net where Zyra finds him. And then the voice returns to Taylor, shocking the apes. Later in the cell, Taylor tries to teach Nova how to speak, but the apes take the girl away and put her in the cell across from him. The man tells her about his life on Earth, but he didn't love anyone there. He wonders if Nova can love. The apes put a collar on him and take him to trial. A hearing is now taking place, and Zyra and Cornelius are ready to act as his attorneys. The judges are outraged. He has no rights because he's not an ape. But then what is he being tried for? The court gives a continuance to his lawyers, but Taylor intends to defend himself. A theologian scientist is called to testify, trying to prove the man's irrationality, as he does not know the answers to the simplest questions. But Taylor cannot know them as he has not studied their culture. A person is prohibited from speaking, so he writes his statement and submits it to the court. Cornelius reads that Taylor is a space explorer and arrived from another planet, but the apes do not believe him. They demand to bring the people captured with him. And Taylor sees Landon, but he does not recognize his friend, and the scar is found on his head. George realizes that Dr. Zayas destroyed the man's brain. George is dragged back to the court. And then Cornelius defends Taylor. He did not lie when he said he came from the Forbidden Zone. He described it very accurately and Cornelius himself was there. And he found traces of ancient ape culture. Zara continues the defense. If he did not come from another planet, he was born on this one. She found no reason why people cannot speak. The problem is not in anatomy, but in the brain. And that is the truth. But nobody wants to listen. Zyra and Cornelius are accused of scientific heresy and the tribunal is closed. The fate of the man is predetermined. He is handed over to Zyas who intends to perform operations on him. George is outraged. How could such an upside-down civilization arise? And most importantly, why is Zyas so afraid of him? Zyra cannot accept this and organizes the escape of Taylor and Nova. Outside the city, Cornelius meets them with horses and supplies. He suggests returning to the spacecraft landing site. 
A small caravan sets off and reaches the river. If they follow it, they will reach the sea. Soon they reach the place where Cornelius was excavating. He is ready to take the man to the cave. And then Zyra sees the pursuit. Dr. Zayas, who caught up with the fugitives, is in for an unpleasant surprise. Taylor is armed. The earthling offers a compromise to the doctor. If Cornelius can prove that their culture is not the oldest and originated from humans, he will leave them alone. Everyone goes into the cave. While Cornelius shows off his findings, Taylor discovers spare parts of a human, a dental plate, glasses, and a heart valve. But the main discovery is a human doll that says the word mama. Zayas tries to find a reasonable explanation when gunshots are heard outside. Everyone rushes to the exit. It's the makeshift doctors who, unable to keep their words, have attacked the fugitives' escorts. Taylor takes Dr. Zayas hostage and orders everyone to leave. Taylor will release him in exchange for a horse, food, and water for him and his woman. But before leaving, he asks the doctor why he always feared him, and he answers because he's a man, and that his ancestors are to blame for the lifeless forbidden lands, for he is the lowest and most treacherous beast. The people leave, and the doctor orders the cave to be blown up, and Zyra and Cornelius to be arrested. He saves the future of his people. Taylor and Nova ride along the beach. Suddenly, the man jumps off the horse in horror. He has returned, and they did it after all. They blew them all up and destroyed civilization, let them burn in hell. Nova looks at Taylor in fear. She doesn't understand what is before her, the upper part of the Statue of Liberty rising on the ocean shore. The film is based on the book by French writer Pierre Boulle, who considered his novel one of his least successful works and therefore had serious doubts about its success on the big screen. But in the end, the film ranked 350th on Empire's magazine's list of the 500 greatest films.